Right, welcome to this session with uh, Dave Conlon. Now, Dave, Dr. Dave Conlon is the Chief and Director of the US National Park Service Submerged Resource Center. It's a small team of underwater archeologists and photographers that provide expert services and consulting to the US National Parks and Partners. He's an experienced open, closed and surface supply diver with dozens of certifications and thousands of dives. Uh, Dave and the team that he works for have embraced the study of human factors and committed to just culture and all operational diving. And a bit of a, a sort of declaration here, I've spent a fair amount of time with Dave and his team training and it's been a pleasure working with them. Now, Dave's presentation is uh, called A Just Culture from the Inside. And the presentation is a personal perspective on being the subject of a government institutional accident investigation based on first-hand experience and through the historical perspective of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, crisis, not crisis. Uh, so, uh, Dave, over to you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, Gareth, thank you so much for the massive amount of work that was put into making this conference happen. Um, and also hats off to the LexGo team that have been busily running around behind the scenes, holding our hands and uh, helping us understand technology. They've been up all night here in the United States. Um, so uh, hats off to those guys as well. A, a virtual drink to you later. Um, the title of this talk has changed uh, several times. Um, it originally started as how not to be the uh, subject of an accident investigation. And maybe that's the unwritten subtext of this whole presentation, but uh, I decided I wanted to kind of make it a little bit different than just kind of a, a complaining session or something like that and see if we couldn't really um, draw some lessons from what happened well, I'm this thing going to me. Um, so this is the, um, this is the uh, job preservation disclaimer here. You know, I, I, I just want to say that um, I'm discussing uh, events that happened with the National Park Service, but I am in no way representing any official or unofficial position of the National Park Service or the government of the United States. The opinions here are mine and mine alone, but you'll be presented facts um, as they happened, but also the opinions. And as I said, these opinions are my own. And then finally, uh, you know, the, the world of diving is quite small. Many of you may be familiar with some of the details of my dive accident, um, but I wanna say at the outset that ultimately I am responsible for my safety while diving. Um, and by extension, everything that happened um, in the events is in some way due to things that I did or did not do. Um, the company that produced the equipment that I had that I was using at the time of my accident has changed management. Uh, now it turns out more than once um, and they have uh, radically revamped their procedures and their user interfaces. So uh, it's almost uh, impossible to imagine that uh, the same accident that happened to me might happen again at some point in the future. And nothing in my presentation should be seen as a disparagement of any uh, past or present equipment uh, maintenance or manufacturing procedures by any party or any entity. So just a little bit about um, me and the Submerged Resources Center. We started with the best acronym in government. We were the SCREW unit, the Submerged Cultural Resources Unit. Uh, we were established in the 1980s to study the impacts of reservoir inundation on archeological sites. And when that particular project ended, the National Park Service realized that uh, they had a need and we were quite useful. So they established us as a permanent fixture in the federal government. We're primarily underwater archeologists, but also photographers and videographers. And we're sort of a small team of nine. And we are a team of experts. We come into parks and work with partners. And we are sort of the, the, the capability around which larger projects can be built. The National Park Service um, system is massive and the underwater side of the system is also massive. The Park Service manages more coastline than the country of Brazil. We manage about five and a half million acres of submerged land. And so that's approximately the size of the state of New Jersey. Um, we are divers, we're scientists, and we're also park rangers. 
And um, we spend a lot of time training and we spend a lot of time um, working on our team dynamics through a lens of human factors and just culture. So one of our training dives in 2012, we went to Lake Mead National Recreation Area, which is just outside of Las Vegas, Nevada. And Lake Mead, in Lake Mead, there is a, a massive industrial facility called the Aggregate Washing and Sorting Facility that was um, used in the 1920s for the construction of Hoover Dam. It washed and sorted gravel and sand, and gravel and sand, when combined with cement, creates concrete. And depending on the different mixtures of gravel and sand, you create concrete with different structural properties. This uh, approximately six acre facility um, was submerged by the lake that resulted from the construction of Hoover Dam. And a lot of the industrial facilities are still there. There are train tracks, there are uh, building foundations, and, and it, over the years it's become both a training ground and an opportunity to, to map this. And it's open as a recreational dive site for people who come to Lake Mead and want to do some diving. So this is just kind of a, an example of, of what we're doing. When we first started working on the site, it was about 160 feet deep now because of uh, drought and reservoir drawdown, the site's about 90 feet um, and the, the lake continues to go down. But these are, here you can see, these are uh, the uh, existing piles of aggregate that are sorted according to size and overlaid on top of that, it was our dive plan. So we were diving off of a barge and our boat, the Cal Cummings. <coughs> And uh, my dive buddy and I were uh, going in on the first dive and the idea was to lay a cave line um, on the red line here and then come back for uh, back up to the boat and have the rest of the team um, follow in sort of teams of two at about 20 minute intervals. So my buddy and I, we jumped in the water did our S drills, checked everything out, did our bubble check, went down to um, depth, which is about 120 feet, swam across to here, swam across to here, swam over to here, laid line the whole way, came back here to here. And then because we had extra time, we decided to take a small detour, go over here, have a look at some other stuff and come back. And right about here, uh, my buddy turned around and saw me uh, non-responsive, in the water column, uh, trembling, quivering with my uh, loop out of my mouth and my backup regulator deployed, but not in my mouth. She swam over to me, tried to put my regulator in my mouth, had no success doing that and uh, started to swim me to the surface. And then at some point uh, she activated my BCD and launched me solo from depth and I made it to the surface where the rest of the team saw me unconscious, uh, grabbed me, pulled me back over to the boat, initiated our emergency response protocols, um, and then the accident proceeded from there to uh, aerial evacuation, um, recompression, emergency procedures that we had figured out, and um, here I am. So. Looking at the dive profile, you can see here, this is um, my depth in red, and these are three of the oxygen sensors in my rebreather unit. So we start, we sit at about 15 feet, we're doing our S drills, we drop down to the bottom, and at 1.0 atmospheres of oxygen, which is you know the most that you can get on the surface, all three sensors are reading the same. About nine minutes and 20 seconds into the dive at about 1.3 atmospheres, two of the sensors flatline and the third sensor starts to climb. Now, what one would expect is, is that these two sensors are reading correctly and the sensor is actually starting to fail and giving um, bad readings. But what has actually happened is, is that these two sensors have failed slightly below set point and this sensor is actually reading the proper uh, percentage of oxygen in the loop. However, the voting logic in the system has voted out the actual functioning sensor 
and it's relying on these two sensors, which are reading slightly below set point. And the system is continuing to automatically uh, add oxygen into my loop. So 12 minutes into the dive, uh, now I am breathing above a 1.6 atmosphere of oxygen. So it's starting to get into the oxygen danger zone. And 12 minutes and 10 uh, seconds into the dive, the breathing loop is reading 3.2 atmospheres of oxygen. And then the third sensor starts to decay and starts to fail and it is no longer reading correctly either. And about 26 minutes and 50 seconds into the dive, I had a massive oxygen toxicity event, a full body seizure, a loss of, loss of consciousness. Um, my partner brought me to about 70 feet and then launched me to the surface in an uncontrolled ascent. So if you look at the trace here, what you see is, is that uh, the depth is going on here and this is uh, oxygen uh, this is oxygen pressure in my cylinder, uh, and this is um, diluent in my cylinder. And what you see is, is that throughout the course of the dive, the pressure in the oxygen cylinder is dropping, which indicates continual addition of oxygen into the breathing mix. <clears throat> and then here, the massive drop of pressure in my diluent is my buddy using that to inflate my BCD to launch me to the surface. When you actually do the math, um, the inferred PO2 of my breathing loop before I actually had a, a toxic event was about 4.12 atmospheres prior to my seizure. So you can see here, this is the trace inferred by the physics and um, so yes, a little bit above and beyond what would be normal. This is um, the trace just for my depth reading. And you can see at the very end, um, after my buddy inflates my BC and launches me for the surface, my ascent rate is over 200 feet per minute. As my friend and colleague, Steve Sellers pointed out, I was like Buzz Lightyear going to infinity and beyond. So um, I was kept unconscious in the hospital in intensive care in Las Vegas for two and a half days. I was intubated. I was treated for um, DCS and possible um, arterial gas embolism. And when I woke up, I had zero deficits, but I could only remember the early portion of the dot. I was released from the hospital on November 8th and have since returned to full duty, including rebreather diving. And I think that both I and the National Park Service had sort of the same question. What the fuck just happened to me? And I think that looking at this after uh, almost nine years, um, the very best way that I can sort of paint an analogy is through a reference to nuclear Armageddon. In October 1962, prompted by three principal events, one was the failed invasion of Cuba um, in 1961 uh, at the Bay of Pigs. The second is the uh, sort of relative um, strategic um, disadvantage of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the third is a sort of desire to, um, on the part of uh, Soviet first premier Nikita Khrushchev to reestablish dominance on the world stage. Um, Russia installed uh, medium and short range intercontinental ballistic missiles in Cuba. The missiles were designed to deliver nuclear warheads and threatened almost all of the continental United States. For 13 very tense days, uh, Russia and the United States teetered on the very knife edge of nuclear war and global annihilation. Um, after very tense uh, 
political negotiations and uh, back and forth, coupled with saber rattling, um, the two antagonists stepped away from each other. Russia removed uh, missiles from Cuba and the United States later very quietly removed American Jupiter intermediate range ballistic missiles from sites in Turkey. Uh, this event is generally accepted to be the closest the planet has ever come to global thermonuclear war. In 1971, a political scientist and a student of international relations, Graham Ellison, wrote a classic book studying the Cuban Missile Crisis called The Essence of Decision. This was the first publication of the newly formed John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And what Allison did was sort of use what people have called the Rochamon effect to explain the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, Rochamon, for those of you who don't know, is Akira Kurosawa's classic movie about a uh, murder, about a rape of a bride, and about four different perspectives on the same event that provide slightly different information. Kurosawa's movie um, sort of introduced Japanese cinema to the world stage. It won an Academy Award, and it also introduced one of my favorite actors of all time, Toshiro Mifune, to, um, to global cinema. Allison looked at this event in Cuba as explainable in three principal ways. He created three different analytical frameworks and looked at the same set of facts through each one of those frameworks. The first, a rational actor model, is sort of what we think of traditionally when we think of um, international politics and, and global interactions. And this treats institutions like people with discrete rational motivations and goals. But then he dug a little bit deeper and looked at what he calls an organizational process model, which is um, where events and challenges are funneled into existing bureaucratic structures and processes. And then finally, he looked at a third one, which was the governmental politics model, which looks at institutions as um, sort of diffuse aggregates of individuals and groups that politic and, and argue and advocate for their own particular intrigues within the context of a larger institution. So for the Cuban Missile Crisis and the rational actor model, there's kind of three principal actors. So there's Nikita Khrushchev, there's Fidel Castro, and there's John F. Kennedy. So for the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev was looking for a counter to the placement of American Jupiter nuclear missiles in Turkey and Italy, an emplacement that threatened the Russian capital of Moscow. He was also looking to make up for a strategic imbalance in intercontinental ballistic missiles that he could make up with smaller, shorter range, intermediate and short range nuclear um, missiles. Fidel Castro was sort of shaken to his core. He was newly installed as the leader of Cuba after the Cuban Revolution and had already suffered a ground invasion at the Bay of Pigs. John F. Kennedy was uh, trying to support his party for the midterm elections that were coming up in November of 1962 and was also reeling from the public relations disaster and international fiasco of the Bay of Pigs. So he was looking to assert American dominance and control and obviously the emplacement of nuclear missiles on America's doorstep was something that he felt he could not stand. Now for my dive accident, looking at it as a rational actor model, you would think that, okay, we're all on the same team. We all have the same goals. We all want to know what in the world happened to me during my dive accident. You know, I was one of the Park Service's most experienced divers and I almost died. And so you would think that people would come in and want to know what happened, how did it happen, what happened with the equipment, how did it fail, what did we do wrong, what would we do right, and how can we continue to, to do this? And, you know, as a kind of rational actor model, I, I can't say that 
you know, we weren't, we as a team in the Submerged Resources Center, we weren't particularly excited about, um, clearly we weren't excited about the dive accident, but we felt like we had fielded a very rare, potentially lethal accident and done it very well. And we were committed to exploring the processes and the failures and also the successes. And going into it, we thought, okay, this is something that we will go through. We weren't happy about the accident, but eager to learn from it and apply those lessons to future operations. Well, boy, were we wrong. So another way to look at the Cuban Missile Crisis is through what's called the organizational process model. And you know, the simple mnemonic for this is really, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So when faced with anomalous events and trying to understand something that they haven't experienced before, bureaucracies reach for what's familiar. Bu bureaucracies reach into existing teams, existing structures, and try and figure out what's going on. For the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the things that happened was once the decision was made to in place intermediate range um, and short range ballistic missiles into Cuba, then the implementation of that was turned over to Soviet military construction brigades. And these brigades, what they did is they took existing procedures and existing patterns and layouts for um, missiles and they stuck them in Cuba. So this is a Soviet surface to air two, SA-2 missile uh, defense system. And these were in place in Cuba to cover the intermediate and short range ballistic missiles. Um, so the construction battalions rolled in and they built one of these or several of these in Cuba and the overflying American U-2 reconnaissance aircraft looked at that and said, aha, this is a uh, Soviet missile battery and it's designed to defend something. The Russian troops that also came in to service and support um, both the air-to-air -air missile or surface-to-air missiles and the um, intermediate ballistic missiles um, they, uh, they decided to paint red stars, red army stars on the roofs of their barracks, which again was a glaring sign to overflying reconnaissance aircraft that, um, you know, something was going on here. On the American side, the Americans didn't do much better. So faced with this sort of looming crisis, what they did is they loaded up their B-47 strategic bombers um, with atomic bombs and dispersed them from air bases in the United States to civilian airports, both inside and outside um, the United States. Also at the same time, American B-52 longer range strategic bombers were orbiting just outside of Russian airspace um, on full alert with the ability to strike at the heart of Russia at any time. Both of these bureaucratic responses were things that, okay, we're gonna do this and, and once the decision that was, was made for this to happen, um, the sort of rote bureaucracy took over. And these two things intensified and precipitated existing tensions and did nothing to diffuse the situation. Interestingly enough, John F. Kennedy, a Navy man himself, ultimately decided that what he should do is to sponsor or, or to advocate for a naval blockade of Cuba. And he relied on the structures and the people that he knew best, i.e. the Navy, instead of the Air Force and Strategic Air Command. So for my dive accident, at about the same time as my accident, uh, Hurricane and then uh, Superstorm Sandy had walloped the U.S. mid-Atlantic coast. And the Park Service was stretched stretch pretty thin as investigators were pulled into investigating things that were going on in parks that had been impacted by the storm. So what they did is they decided that they needed to do something quickly, even though the crisis had resolved, I was in no danger of dying anymore, but they felt they, you know, faced with this, this problem, they had to figure out something. So what they did is they figured that investigators are investigators and an investigation is an investigation. And so they convened a team in what's called a serious accident investigation team and they drew on law enforcement. So the law enforcement team 
well, the team dominated by law enforcement was convened. And one of the things that they did not do is they didn't have a diver that was familiar with uh, rebreathers, didn't have a diver that was familiar with uh, oxygen sensors, didn't have anyone that was familiar with uh, processes of scientific diving or how it's done in the United States. So they convened a team and they rolled in and there was a clash of cultures immediately. You know, uh, initial comments from the investigation team that they were gonna get to the bottom of this and don't try to hide anything because we're gonna find out what's happening no matter what, really didn't go over very well with the team. Uh, questions about whether I had drug and alcohol problems, questions about how, uh, what the status of my marriage was, um, those sorts of things, which were all pretty standard for a law enforcement investigation all came to the fore and again, kind of alienated the subjects of the investigation um, from the people who were conducting the investigation. In addition, our efforts to uh, recommend people who could be added to the investigation team, who knew something about rebreathers, who knew something about uh, scientific diving, um, were all seen as uh, attempts to interfere with the conduct of the investigation. And things quickly spiraled out of control and we got very, very oppositional in the sense that, uh, you know, they felt like we were obstructing the, the investigation. We felt like they were not conducting the, the appropriate investigation. Um, things got just absolutely bananas. Uh, you know, to the point where the investigation team started to invent criteria that we should have adhered to, they felt, um, and then castigating us for not doing so. Um, the investigation stumbled on for two, more than two years. And um, what was going on is the agency was trying to adapt existing procedures into an anomalous event. So, that's sort of what was going on, but there was more going on as well. And that's where we get to the kind of third uh, model that was used to study the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is the government politics model. So in the governmental politics model, what, what it recognizes is, is that, that government entities and agencies aren't really monolithic. They're not individuals and they're not groups of a like mind. They're, they're a confederation that are more or less aligned to um, the kind of goals and, and stated objectives of the organization itself. And these individual factions within the larger institutions are politicking and, and looking for opportunities to advance their own causes and, and trying to figure out what was going on. So looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis, it, you know, in 1962, Khrushchev was feeling the sting of American successes um, with the emplacement of Jupiter missiles in Turkey. The Russian economy was not doing well and Khrushchev was having to, to pull back on defense spending, which made his generals and admirals very unhappy. And so they were politicking internal to, to the Soviet Union trying to reestablish their uh, importance and dominance. And Khrushchev felt like the emplacement of missiles in Cuba was a relatively inexpensive way for him to kind of push forward um, Russian uh, um, po power in a way that was pretty definitive and pretty decisive. You know, for Fidel Castro, uh, the emplacement of nuclear missiles in Cuba dealt him into a whole nother level of a geopolitical game. Suddenly, Cuba was in some ways a proxy for a nuclear power. And for Kennedy, because of the failed sort of Bay of Pigs invasion, he was reeling from that as a public relations debacle. The CIA had assured him that the invasion would be a success, and it turned into an absolute mess. Um, Republicans in, uh, you know, campaigning in the midterm elections in 1962 had picked up uh, Kennedy's failure at the Bay of Pigs and made it into a huge election year issue. And um, so Kennedy felt like he had to respond to the criticisms of the Republicans uh, who were, you know, beating him up publicly and privately. 
the CIA had had fallen out of favor with the Kennedy administration after their assurances. And so the things that the CIA were putting on the table as options for to counter the emplacement of these missiles in Cuba, i.e. airstrikes followed by invasions, were not really seen as kind of legitimate or uh, they were colored by their failure in 1961 to really understand what was going to happen during the Bay of Pigs. Um, Kennedy uh, was also getting pushed hard by General Curtis LeMay, who was the uh, the general in charge of the newly formed Strategic Air Command. And, and LeMay was um, gung-ho about uh, a, an airstrike on the missile bases followed potentially by an airstrike um, against the Soviet Union. And for those of you who are able to watch the uh, the American classic, uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, LeMay is uh, quite uh, visibly skewered as one of the generals in, in that movie. So looking at my um, dive accident, what was going on? Well, you know, issues that had little to no bearing on the accident were introduced into the investigation by different factions in the Park Service. This every crisis is an opportunity was seen by factions in the Park Service as an opportunity to beat up on other factions in the Park Service. And the investigation became kind of a lever and a cudgel for internal politics that long preceded my accident and continue to this day. In addition, the culture of National Park Service science clash really hard with law enforcement. I mean, science is sort of a free form examination of what's going on in the world and law enforcement is very much a kind of top down, rigid, hierarchical uh, command and control function. Um, you know, the, the, the practice of scientific diving as it happens in the United States depends on a diving control board. The diving control board is supposed to be made up primarily of divers and diving has the diving control board has absolute and total control over diving as it's done in the agency. And this kind of wording absolute and total control was just, you know, fuel for a fire where the, the investigators were saying, you know, you can't do that. You have to you have to respond. And the, the dive control board was saying, no, we, we don't. And by policy and by law, um, that's not the case. Anyway, this was, you know, just one instance of, of many of a kind of clash of cultures. So ultimately, the investigation kind of sputtered to a halt and no final report was ever released. The investigation ran over two years. And in the end, I think that everyone kind of realized that, um, you know, that a law enforcement investigation designed to find fault, des designed to find guilt, designed to ascertain what someone had done wrong was really not the right lens in which to look at um, a diving accident. You know, and, and I think that if you kind of look in at the shorthand of, of these kind of different ways of understanding institutions, um, it all sort of begins to make sense. You know, the, the Park Service was shocked by the, the, you know, my near death, and they felt they needed to do something quickly. They didn't have available accident investigators, and they thought, well, investigations are investigations, so we'll get investigators who do law enforcement. And law enforcement came in and, and did what they thought they were supposed to do. They came in and they wanted to figure out who was guilty, who had done something wrong, what had happened, and 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 get to the bottom of it. You know, and in the end, what happened is is that the sort of governmental politics model um, established itself, and, and and this investigation turned into one where someone was going to win and someone was going to lose. You know, and, and nine years on. After this accident, I, I think about it, and and I believe that I'm pretty much prepared to move on, you know. But I have run into some of the investigators over the years subsequent to the investigation, and they are still really sore. Some of them about this, and that's too bad. 
you know, and, and the report will never get released. And that's an opportunity for learning that the agency will, will miss out on. Um, both learning about what went right and what went wrong. I mean, it's no small feat to pull a diver in a full body seizure from 120 feet off the bottom of a lake and, and have them make a full recovery. Um, and there's a lot of good things that happen that, you know, aren't formally talked about. But the other thing is, is that in the sort of governmental politics model, you know, the investigation morphed into something where someone was going to win and someone was going to lose. And ultimately, I don't believe that the law enforcement investigators that ran the investigation think that they won. And their careers and their causes were not advanced by um, participation in the investigation. And I think that there's a complete disconnect there because they did what they were told to do. They conducted an investigation as they knew it. And in the end, they were told that it was wrong and that their investigation was not releasable. And they had, they feel like they had, they had done something wrong. And for my part, you know, um, and to some extent for the rest of the team, I can't say that I'm particularly happy about how things turned out either. So maybe in a sense, that's kind of okay because we both, um, you know, both sides of it walk away feeling kind of bad, but <clears throat> kind of as an overall perspective, you know, ultimately Russia and the U.S. walked away from the precipice of nuclear oblivion. Russia removed its missiles from Cuba and its troops. <clears throat> and then several months later, uh, Kennedy very quietly removed the intermediate range ballistic missiles that he had in place in Turkey um, and things sort of uh, headed back more towards an even keel. Um, you know, the, the Park Service investigation of my diving accident has never been released um, and likely never will be. A law enforcement investigation doesn't produce accident recommendations and it is not in any way conducive to just culture. It's conducive to justice. And those are two different things. I return to full duty, <clears throat> including diving, technical diving with rebreathers and um, we reaffirmed our commitment to just culture and we do talk about this accident and we do everything that we can to learn about it and to share it. And, um, you know, that's why I'm here talking to you today, because I think that when you look at um, what we're doing here, we spend a lot of time talking about human factors in diving, but ultimately that's only half of the equation because the other half of the equation is the agencies that control diving, the agencies that produce regulations, the, the institutions that house our, our programs and that investigate our accidents. And almost all accidents are done by agencies. And so if we're looking at agencies, we need to understand them, not as individuals, but through the lens of, of, of organizational structure in international politics. And these larger ag aggregates are gonna respond differently than a single individual. Now, looking at the Rochamon effect in my dive accident, there are clearly more than three different perspectives. But I think that one thing that I would like you all to take away from this talk is to understand that when an accident happens or when something um, needs to change and an institution gets involved, we're dealing with a different dynamic than if we're dealing with individuals. <clears throat> and if we're only focused on individuals and motivations, then we're not gonna be able to understand or control the other side of the diving equation. And as you can see in my instance, just culture may be in peril. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, Gareth's on mute. Oh, he's done it again. He's pressing the little button. It's not working. It is now. <laughs> Dave, thank you for that. And I think one of the, the common threads that's come through the conference so far is, is that need to, to look at different perspectives, um, not just individuals as individuals, you know, within a dive team or, or anything. It's actually looking much further and, and your points bring that out quite, uh, quite nicely. So um, I've got a, a quick question, um, which is really which links in with your presentation or David Kincannon's presentation yesterday 
you know, what is the national park, or what could the National Park Service have done differently then? And what are they doing differently now to take on maybe the institutional lessons rather than the accident operational uh, issues? Well, uh, you know, I think that um, for those of you who missed Dave Concannon's talk, I, I would encourage you to to see it. And he he took the opportunity to point out some deficiencies that that the Park Service has done in its investigation of of visitor fatalities. But I think that um, you know the same deficiencies applied in my case as well. And and so what the Park Service is doing is is trending more towards the Forest Service model. And they're, you know, it was clear at the, you know, after two years of investigation and all sorts of um, pain and suffering for many different people concerned, including myself, um, in terms of angst and, and you know, bother, uh, the Park Service realized that, that a law enforcement framework is not the right one for an accident investigation. And so they, they have committed to uh, structured learning um, rather than uh, kind of a, a finding fault type of investigation. So that's what's going on now. And, right. and, and this has been a sort of a, a, a lesson that has been variously taken on board at, at different levels throughout the Park Service. Some um, are refusing to accept the, those conclusions and others have embraced it. But I think overall, the agency is trending more towards a structured learning rather than a finding fault. Cool. Brilliant. Thank you. I have got somebody from the audience. Come on up and Andres. Over to Hi, you. Guys. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's a great story and the way you were real. And I just want to, and I love your reference to the, uh, to the movie and to the, uh, Cuban, Cuban crisis, and I wanted to ask, uh, have you thought about making a story? I mean, making it into a, because it sounds like a story for a book, or it sounds like a story for at least um, close calls. Uh, I, I, it sounds like a, something we can learn from. So yeah, that's my question. What do you, what do you think, think about it? Well, <clears throat> No, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and I'll tell you why, uh, you know, this is something that happened to me. Um, and I think that, it, it, you know, I bear some responsibility into how events unfolded. Um, but, and I talk about it at, at, in, in venues such as this and, and elsewhere, um, but this is just something that happened to me. You know, and, and what the, the actual, what happened is, is that the rebreather went in for service. It was serviced at the factory and the, the sensors were not replaced. And this particular model of rebreather, you can't see the sensors when you open it up. So the, the sensors were, were 33 months old when I used it. So two of the three failed and became current limited. So it was a dual sensor failure. These are, these, these sorts of events are, are quite rare. Um, and, you know, in the sort of nine years since the accident, I, I talk about it as much as I can. And, um, but at the same time, it's not something that I care to be known for necessarily. You know, I mean, I survived a dual sensor failure. And I, and I don't think that's really the right way to even put it because my team saved me from a dual sensor failure. I was, I was gone, you know, I, I did nothing. I mean, I had the accident, all the actions that saved me came from the team. So, I mean, maybe we should talk a little bit more about that instead of what happened to me, because those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that, that you know, will are worth sharing and worth talking about. So, you know, I, I, would, I would talk about that and, and I would be willing to write about that, but, you know, um, as a that. whole thing, it's a, it's another perspective. So if you if you put it the way you put it through your presentation through a different perspective, uh, I think that also the has a place in that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Excellent, excellent right. question. It reminds me of a, a video that was doing the rounds um, three years ago about the Seoul uh, Korean ferry 
uh, disaster and just looking at different perspectives where you look at it from one which is a, a punitive based compliance based activity and the other one is how does it make sense for people to do what they did um, and I think there's there's definitely this emphasis that what the team did to, to recover the situation uh, you know in the discussions we've had with you and your team is is those success stories we, we often focus on the negative uh, and in fact it's one of the things that I got picked up when I put uh, under pressure the book together was a couple of people wrote in and went, can I can I put a submission, you know, a positive story in here as opposed to something that's gone wrong and, and show you the benefit of applying non-technical skills and, and human factors into a situation. It's like, yeah, cool, thank you. You know, because we do get so biased on the negative and yet it's the positive and the reinforcement that goes there that can add to the real learning. So, Dave, thank you. You know, you know Gareth, after, <clears throat> after my accident, um, you know, you talk in your human factors about how when, when people are, are put under pressure, they, they sort of revert to type. And and I, I distinctly remember an episode where, um, you know, it was me in a room with the seven members of the accident investigation team. And I had them all on the ropes. I had them backed up against the wall and I was railing on each and every one of them about how they had no idea what they were talking about, how they didn't have, you know, they weren't even approaching it from the right way. And, you know, after my accident, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out <clears throat> how many dual sensor failures had actually happened and how many people had survived them. And, you know, the total number is unknown, but the number of people who have survived them is like four altogether. And, you know, and, and I remember just saying, you know, I should be dead, I should be a vegetable. Uh, you know, and, and you're you're beating up on me for not having a satellite phone on site. And 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 here I am, you know, and 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 with the, the power of my preserved brain that my team helped save, I have all of you guys up against the wall and and, and, and I've got you argued into a corner and, and you know I said you don't understand how absolutely remarkable and magnificent of, of the, the fact of my survival is whether you like me or hate me, the truth is, is that getting someone up off the bottom of a lake at 120 feet alive and intact is absolutely remarkable. So. Exactly, exactly. So Dave, thank you. And, and I love the fact you are able to tell this story. And in fact, it's how we ended up meeting at a Eurotech six or seven years ago. So uh, when that story was told, so thank you for that. Uh, if anybody else would like a longer chat with Dave, uh, he will be in the lobby on the Hall 1 table. Um, and then at the top of the hour, we've got uh, Pierre Lefebvre and Robin Kirkpatrick, who are going to talk about how human factors can influence the outcome in commercial diving. And, and the sort of subtext to this is unconscious at 156 metres. So um, uh, slightly deeper than yours, Dave um and uh, and recover the situation and it'll be a sort of a two two-part interview between uh, pierre and robin so uh looking forward to that one and we'll see you in 12 minutes thanks very much everybody